Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to welcome you to City of Wildwood's Planning and Zoning Commission for September 3rd, 2019. Uh, this meeting is live streamed, and I want to remind you to turn off your cell phones uh, if possible. On tonight's agenda, we have one public hearing item, one information report, one action of resolution of the Planning and Zoning Commission, one correspondence item, and one site development plan recommendation. Um, can I have a roll call of commission members? Commissioner Helfrey? Here. Commissioner Levitt? Here. Commissioner Cohn? Commissioner Gragnani? Here. Commissioner Beatty? Here. Commissioner Depler? Here. Commissioner Simpson? Chair Lee? Present. Council Member Werther? Present. Mayor Bolin? Here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Newberry. Um, Let's see, I'll bring up the approval of uh, the minutes from August 19th. Um, Commissioner Gregnani, motion to approve. I have a second. Commissioner Beatty, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Abstain. Okay, one abstention. Commissioner Levitt. Uh, Mr. Vunich, do you have any opening remarks? Okay. Moving on to public comment session. Um, Mr. Newberry, I'm sure we have some speaker cards. Yes, sir, we do. Ms. Allen? Hi, Victoria Allen, 1651 Idle Rock Farm Road. Uh, I think I would have been a little bit better prepared if I had I known uh, Barbara Springer wasn't going to be here because she truly is the expert and has been throughout the years. <clears throat> I moved here in 1993. Life was wonderful until 1994 when I found out where I lived. And it has not been good since then. There isn't anybody that lives in the area surrounding Russell Bliss's property or the Bliss Ellisville site that would live there had they known what was there. Uh, I, I recall a man that I spoke to who lives in a house that overlooks Russell Blitz's place. He's from another country. He was the only one in the family that spoke English. And he just looked at me and he said, I didn't know. And the real estate agents are complicit in selling people property that is adjacent to this. If this piece of property is developed, these people are going to be living next door to one of the worst Superfund sites in the country. And they're never going to be able to sell their property unless they're dishonest and they're, you know, and they're not going to tell the guy, the next guy, they'll say everything is fine. I have a neighbor that just bought a piece of property and he wasn't told where he was purchasing. And he went to the real estate agent who was sued for selling property that was no, of known contamination. And he cried. It's ruining his marriage. And there's nothing he can do. He's stuck. And if he's honest, he can't sell that property because it's right next to one of the worst Superfund sites. DNR or the EPA is in the process of being defunded. They admit in uh, the DNR admits in their letters that the property or that their equipment isn't sensitive enough. It's not good enough to really test for the levels of chemicals. We know that barrels, thousands of barrels were on this property that were removed. They eroded and they mixed into a brown gelatinous material. There are hundreds of chemicals. I, I spoke to you last time because I just realized that I'm just downstream from, from a 23-acre lake that, that uh, 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 disappeared twice. So we're talking about millions of gallons of water that went underneath my place and that whole area and straight on through to who knows where. But I can guarantee you that it's changed the geology of the land. But that doesn't mean it washed anything away, because we're not talking about water-soluble poison. We're talking about stuff that's made to last, and who knows even really what it is. Uh, the, the wells continue to be contaminated. 
But even though they only test them once a year and there's only eight wells and we don't know exactly where those wells are or which wells are above health standards, but they continue to be contaminated. So we live, I live in a dump. And unfortunately, and as Mr. Topic, I think was his name, said last time, and I think it was really an important thing that he said. The EPA wants to be done with it. They're, they're in the process of being dismantled by the feds. So they're going to let go of it. The DNR is going to let go of it. And who's going to be responsible for that piece of property? The city of Wildwood is. It will never be able to be cleaned up. The geography, the geology does not lend itself to being cleaned. So there really isn't any way that you can find that this property should be developed. These people will be living next door again to one of the worst Superfund sites in the country. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Travis. Mr. Stuckenschneider. Good evening. I'm here to support the Miller House. And I, I, I'm i sorry, my name is Dave Stuckenschneider. I live at 2924 Austin Fort Road. And we've had the property in the family since 1960s. And uh, Wildwood is a pretty special place. And I must say, the Miller House blends right in with Wildwood. It seriously does. Uh, I have been at the Miller House many, many times since it's been open. And uh, I find it to be a very relaxing place, a very fun place. It's a place that you can bring your dog, one of the few in Wildwood. After we go to the Miller House, we run over to the Big Chief because you can have dogs on the uh, terrace out there. So we usually go over there. But Miller House is something special in that um, it, it just has something for everybody. I have, uh, I've had a baby lemur on my head. Some of you may have seen that on... Uh, Facebook. It was holding on for dear life, and I was shaking for dear life. But, uh, and uh, they, they had an adult lemur. They've had a number of different animals. My point is that that was during the summer. Most of the children were off of school, out of school, and they learned a big lesson about nature. And I happened to be lucky enough to become very good friends with the uh, handlers. And they taught us a lot about the, uh, about the different animals. And being uh, almost adult, my wife tells me, uh, I absorbed some of that. And then I passed that on to the children that were there. And there were many, many, many children. And uh, we live broadcast that over Facebook. And we got uh, comments from South Carolina. Uh, it, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. And the children just, they, they were just incredibly, uh, it was just an incredible time for them to actually get to feel the softness of the lemurs. And uh, they did have Stu the rabbit. I'm not sure about the name, but unfortunately, they didn't have Smoke the Pig. They had Petunia the Pig. But uh, so having those animals and, and seeing the children interact and it gave the parents a small break. They could come in, let the kids run around, and it was just a great time. Uh, I uh, was also able to take my dog to the doggy prom. Uh, some of you may have seen the pictures on uh, the Miller House. I have pictures. If you want to see me afterwards, I'll show you the my little dog in a tuxedo. But uh, it was a very fun evening. And uh, the, the owner of the Miller House, 
it, it's it's kind of interesting that she's very on top of trying to be a good neighbor. When uh, we when when we got in there, we started talking to her, she, and she said, "Oh, we're going to have such a big crowd, but but make sure you don't park on the street, and make sure that you stay inside her parking lot." And um, that I I don't I haven't heard any commotions there. Believe me, I I almost live there, but um, there there hasn't been hardly any any. Uh, well, there hasn't been any confrontations that I know of, uh, except between the lemur and me, because the lemur went potty on me. But anyway, so uh, I, I just I cannot say enough about the kind of things that we have in Wildwood, and this is one one venue that is just. Um, uh, it, it's beyond words into what it brings to our community. So um, I'm going to leave it at that. And I just want to tell you that uh, it, it's a great place to go to if you haven't. I even invited my, my friend Jim Bolin down there one day, and he didn't take me up on it. We had some great music there. And we do have great music. Um, well, I'll leave you with this. There was a gentleman there who was singing a song, and he was just wondering how you milk an almond. His wife is a is a health freak, and she uses almond milk, and he was just wondering in the song how you would milk an almond. But anyway, uh, it's a great place. Thank you very much. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, which... I have one more thing. I'm sorry, and just Colombo. One more thing. You know, I I get people to go there. I I have friends all over St. Louis, and uh, as I said, I've invited different people to come there. But the one thing that I find is frustrating is when they finally get there, they always ask me why there wasn't a sign. <laughs> on Manchester Road showing that it was behind this building. So if we could maybe have the permission to put a sign out there, that would be really wonderful. Because then I could tell them, instead of go to the porch, do you know who the porch is? Do you? Does everybody know the porch? Well, my friends from outside of Wildwood don't know what the porch is. They'd stop at every porch and turn left. But anyway. So we do need a sign. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. Mr. Rich or Travis, go ahead. Ms. Miller. My name is Andrea Miller. I reside at 4027 Princeton Ridge Drive, 63025. Um, I am the owner of the Miller House, and um, at 2612 East Avenue um, and I just wanted to introduce myself let you know I was here this evening so when we get to our public um, hearing portion I still get confused on how, how all of it works um, that I am available for any questions or comments or things like that so just let me know if I can answer any questions thank you thank you mr. Newberry Ms. Springer Barbara Springer, 84 Strecker Road. Look at figure one, soil gas levels map. As discussed at our la your last meeting, existing data confirms that the northeast corner of Strecker Forest is equally contaminated as the Wade Simmons with contaminated soil, chemically saturated bedrock, contaminated groundwater, and dangerous levels of soil gas that continually rise into the ambient air as toxic vapors. Not only are these reasons sufficient for supporting the moratorium, but they also suggest that perhaps this area of the Bliss stream bed was not removed in 1996. I am not an attorney, 
but there may be one legal issue that could block the moratorium. The figure to new proposed decision units is from the Tetratech 2013 Addendum Sampling Plan. This is the only map that illustrates the overlap of DU-48 on DU-39. The EPA's failure to notch out DU-48 around DU-39 was not a mistake. They performed surface soil sampling on DUs 45 to 48 for only dioxin. These DU areas were remediated in 1996 and restored to grade with clean backfill soil. In other words, the EPA sent clean soil to the lab and then boasted that the former cleanup had been effective in meeting the cleanup goals. Overlapping DU-48 on DU-39 appears intentional. Look at the Figure 2 study area map and note the MPL boundary. Now compare it to the Strecker Forest Covenant map and note how it ex extends all the way into the northeast corner. When the removal action stopped south of the NPL line, the Bliss stream bed and the corner as intended. In the EPA's March 10, 2014 letter, they stated, the creek stream areas fall outside the area evaluated for this site and this removal action. And therefore, the area with diagonal lines representing the work zone perimeter is erroneous. When questioned, the EPA wrote on March 9, 2015, quote, the Strecker Forest Covenant was executed so that the northeast area of this development property could be efficiently captured in a post-removal one-time transaction. Nice sounding explanation, but what it actually accomplishes is positioning the city into inadvertently accepting the horrendous condition of the Wade Simmons to be placed under a covenant rather than addressing the environmental problems to protect public health. The Bliss Covenant map covers only the removal action area. I hope that the PNZ recommendations support the moratorium and request the correction to the Strecker Forest Covenant so that it too is restricted to only the removal action area. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Mr. Newberry. Ms. Stuckenschneider. Oh, I apologize. I didn't. Thank you. Ms. Reed. Thank you. And Mr. Watts. Um, Dan Watts at 314 Hutchinson Road. Um, this site on the, or the Bliss property should really never be developed, especially not for residential development. After reading the reports, especially the report from the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, it's clear that the lab tests were not specific enough to provide conclusive evidence about dioxin presence. The groundwater and surface samples also prove that the presence of other soil contamination like the VOCs and SVOCs. Disturbing the soil here proposes a real risk for groundwater and runoff water contamination in the area, and the potential for airborne contamination particularly concerns me. Um, I grow all my food in my backyard and ensure that it's all organic, but I'm greatly concerned that this contamination will spread to our backyard since we are downwind from it. Also, ba basements will need to, be need to be dug out and increase the risk of spreading the contaminated soil as well. Those dump trucks and construction trucks will also spread this contaminated soil all over the Wildwood and Ellisville area. We were looking to start a family at our current home and then maybe upgrading and moving to different parts of Wildwood. At this rate, we are not considering that area as well. Um, if Wildwood approves this, they will send a message that they value the pocketbooks of real estate investors and developers more than the safety and well-being of the community they're trusted to protect. Thank you, Mr. Newberry. I have no further speaker cards. Okay. Mr. Boonich, should I move ahead and do the public hearing script? Okay. 
Okay. Tonight's uh, public hearing. In the City of Wildwood, public hearings are truly intended to accept comments and questions concerning this item. Since this is a public hearing and is only intended to provide information on this request, no action is planned on this item tonight, and consideration of it is to be taken no earlier than October 7, 2019. The City of De Department of Planning will address the comments, questions, and concerns that are raised tonight and include them as part of their formal recommendation to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Public hearings are conducted as described in the handout provided on the table in the reception area, along with information on this matter. The Commission will allow our parties adequate time to present their positions and ask that you respect all opinions by other speakers and avoid interrupting anyone during their time at the podium. Persons wanting to speak or receive future information on this item should fill out a speaker's card and leave it with Mr. Newbury. In addition, information on this item can be found on the city's website at www.cityofwildwood.com. The commission would like to thank you for your cooperation and participation in tonight's hearing. Mr. Boonich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair and members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, before the department begins a very brief explanation of this request, it would like to enter into the record the following items. The City of Wildwood Charter, Chapter 415 of the City of Wildwood Municipal Code, the Zoning Ordinance, the file that has been developed and maintained by the Department of Planning regarding this particular request for a conditional use permit, and then finally, any testimony or other exhibits and items provided as part of tonight's hearing. Mr. Chair and members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, today Mr. Newberry and I learned that the petitioners have been considering a alternative location for the placement of the ground-mounted solar panels. The reason behind the consideration of a relocation of them related to last Monday's major storm. The area that had been selected for the ground-mounted solar panels was covered in four feet of water. And so from the perspective of the petitioners, they are rethinking the location and had hoped to have a revised map to the Department of Planning in advance of tonight's public hearing. That did not occur. And without the benefit of specific information relating to location, and our new bylaws relating to postponements, the Department of Planning would respectfully request a postponement to September 16th of this particular matter, and then hopefully we'll have that precise plan and we can proceed forward with the public hearing. So moved. Okay, Mayor Bolin and Commissioner Greg Nani. All those in favor of a postponement say aye. 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 Opposed? Extensions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My apologies to anyone in attendance tonight that came for this particular item. The department cannot postpone an item if it's received if the request is received on the day of the hearing. That's the purview of the Planning and Zoning Commission. So thank you. <coughs> thank you. Okay, so moving on to old business. Um <coughs> Mr. Newberry, will you read PZ 13-19? Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll read the, the item before it into the record. The, oh. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Action on a resolution that states the Planning and Zoning Commission's intent to initiate and act upon the needed extension of the moratorium for PZ 1 and 1A-99 WJ Burn Builders, Inc. 3112 Shady Glen Estates Drive, Wildwood, Missouri 63038, Ward 2. Thank you, Mr. Brunich. Mr. Chair and members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, <coughs> the City Attorney, Mr. Newberry, and I have been preparing for tonight's meeting relative to the Strecker Forest site and in reviewing the zoning ordinance to ensure that all components relative to notifications, initiations, things along those lines have been met. It was discovered that in our code, items that are generated for consideration relative to the Planning and Zoning Commission or City Council has to be done by resolution. 
And so tonight, in advance of the department's presentation of its information report with recommendation, the city attorney and the Department of Planning have prepared a resolution authorizing the August 5th, 2019 public hearing that was conducted approximately two weeks ago. Mr. Young, our city attorney, may want to add more to the presentation. This is more of an administrative approach just to ensure that every I is dotted and every T is crossed. Thank you, Mr. Vunich. Um, I have a recommendation to accept the department's resolution. Commissioner Levitt. Second. Second by Councilman Werther. Roll call vote. Commissioner Helfrey. Yes. Commissioner Levitt. Yes. Commissioner Gragnani. Yes. Commissioner Beatty. Yes. Commissioner Deppler. Yes. Chair Lee? Yes. Councilmember Werther? Aye. Mayor Bolin? Yes. Passes. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll move on to PZ 13 19. Travis, if you could read that. PZ 13 19, City of Wildwood, Missouri, 616860, Main Street, Wildwood, Missouri, 63040, Care of Department of Planning. A request for the presentation of a recommendation by the Planning and Zoning Commission upon an item relating to an extension of a moratorium that is associated with PZ1 and 1A-99, WJ Burn Builders, Inc., 3112 Shady Glen Estates Drive, Wildwood, Missouri, 63038, which incorporates an approved planned residential development overlay district that authorizes 23 authorizes a 23-lot residential subdivision located on a 18.33-acre tract of land being situated on the north side of Strecker Road, east of Inglebrook Drive. Locator numbers 22U240024, 22U330031, 22 and 22U330062. Street addresses 177 Strecker Road, 165 Strecker Road, and 173 Strecker Road. Given the current stay on the issuance of permits for the development of the site in accordance with the approved site development plan has been in place for over 11 years but still requires certain determinations and actions relative to the subject tract of land, Ward 2. Thank you, Mr. Newberry. Uh, Mr. Vinch. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair and members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, the Department of Planning has prepared for your consideration tonight a information report with recommendation regarding the request to continue or extend the moratorium relative to the Strecker Forest site. At the public hearing, the Department of Planning and many of the speakers that spoke during the hearing itself identified data gaps that exist relative to Strecker Forest, the Ellisville Bliss site, and other locations in its vicinity. These data gaps have been the root in many regards to the ongoing concerns that the city of Wildwood has regarding development of any properties that are on the national priorities list or adjoin or abut the same. These data gaps have been tried to be filled over the course of the last 11 years and you heard even tonight from one of the residents that there still is missing information that the city lacks relative to important testing that should have been done, may have been done, or has not been done. Also, besides just the fact that the moratorium allows us the opportunity to work with the federal and state governments to uncover and to develop the information that has been sought by the city and others for the past 11 years. It also gives the city an opportunity to consider a new overlay district, one that would be applied to sites such as the Ellisville Bliss locations that are within the city of Wildwood, as well as Strecker Forest and the Callahan property. We have a planned residential development overlay district, the PRD. We use that extensively in town center and other locations throughout the community. 
But this would be very different in the opinion of the city attorney and the Department of Planning. It would provide the basis for that understanding of information, the provision, more importantly, of that information, and then ensure that whatever ultimate decision is made, those that are involved are given full knowledge of the risk and have an opportunity to understand what they are buying or what they are not. So in many regards, this overlay district that is potentially being considered would be more of a red flag on the property than just a typical overlay district to adjust lot sizes, setback distances relative to front, side, and rear yard areas, etc. So the moratorium has many benefits. It gives the city the time to continue to press those that have the information to get the information. It gives the city the time to take that information when or if received and get it to the experts that can help interpret and advise the community on appropriate next steps. It also gives the city the time to obtain other information that it believes is essential that may come from other sources besides the federal and state governments. And then finally, look at an approach that may, for all intents and purposes, provide the buyer of a lot or a buyer of a property that has a existing known environmental problem or a potential environmental problem, all of the protections they need so as if they do proceed forward, they have a good understanding of what they're facing and what the outcomes might be. The moratorium is an essential tool in the zoning process. It's only used by the city of Wildwood on very infrequent occasions, but it has always been used when the public safety and the necessity was such that additional time was necessary to ensure that decisions that were made or are going to be made are made with the best available information and in a time frame that allows that information to be understood, processed, and then disseminated to the community for the benefit of all. Tonight, the Department of Planning is recommending that the moratorium be extended to a date uncertain. The information report does say that the timeline is at the discretion of the federal and state governments in many ways. If they provide the information we seek in a responsive manner, the timeline may be less. If they don't, we'll continue to ask for the things we need as a city. So therefore, again, we are recommending the moratorium be extended. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boonich. I have a recommendation to accept the department's. So moved. Mayor Boland, second by Commissioner Greg Nani. Um, Mr. Chair, are there any questions from the Planning and Zoning Commission Commissioner members of Mr. Young or Mr. Newberry or I? Mr. Vonage, um, I did hear you say that it's a time frame is, un is uncertain. I'm assuming that that is when the, the department feels that we have all of the information we need to make an informed decision as to what is going to happen there. So could be months, could be whenever. Again, the department would not want to venture a guess if it's months or years. Again, it's premised on those agencies authorized to protect the environment and people from environmental risk provide to the city the information that is sought for years. So basically when we feel we've got enough information. When we is not the Department of Planning, we will be the conduit, but the, the, will, the conduit will bring the information to the commission, right. which is the first tier of decision making, then to city council, and then throughout that process to the community at large. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Levitt. Yes, I, I believe we need to send a clear message and approve the um, department's recommendation 
Um, secondly, do I understand it correctly that we could say that over all the years we've tried to get complete data and we have not been satisfied that that's occurred. And so this moratorium potentially could be permanent if we continue to not have numbers and information that we've requested year after year. From the department's perspective, the information is needed. And that information once received needs to be analyzed by those that understand it much better than the Department of Planning. There is litigation that is underway relative to this site between the developer slash owner and the city of Wildwood. A judge could change all of this. But as long as the department, the Planning and Zoning Commission, and City Council feel that there's missing information, gaps in the data, essential reasoning or rationales why the federal and state governments believe this is a suitable site for residential use, full residential use, and I would say it would go on as long as necessary. Seeing no further comments, uh, roll call vote. Commissioner Beatty? Yes. Commissioner Deppler? Yes. Commissioner Helfrey? Yes. Commissioner Levitt? Yes. Commissioner Gragnani? Yes. Chair Lee? Yes. Councilmember Werther? Aye. Mayor Boland? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to new business. Mr. Newbury. Yes, sir. The City Council authorized an amendment to a C-8 planned commercial district ordinance in June 2018 to allow for the use of an existing building for a coffee shop, lounge, bar, event space, and shared use office concept. The Miller House, St. Louis County's PC 112-89 Cliff Ruffgar. The determination which allowed these activities was accompanied by a certain set of conditions that were intended to ensure they would not cause issues upon surrounding lots or roadways. Among the conditions relating to these allowances was the requirement for review of these activities after the initial six-month period of time by the Planning and Zoning Commission and City Council, with an annual report to be issued each year thereafter. With the grand opening of the Miller House occurring in March 2019, the Planning and Zoning Commission will conduct its initial six-month review of the operations compliance of two cities' requirements and, res and responses to any comments received on the same from the general public. The Miller House is located south of Manchester Road, east side of East Avenue, street address 2612 East Avenue, locator number 24V510441, Ward 8. Thank you, Mr. Newberry. Mr. Runich. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair and members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, the Department of Planning has prepared for your consideration tonight a report relating to the Miller House and its first six months of operation on East Avenue. The first question that the Planning and Zoning Commission may have in its mind is that if the ordinance was approved in June of 2018, why are we here in September of 2019? That would be greater than six months ago. In the report that the department's prepared, it does note that as with any construction project, whether it be installing plumbing or repairing plumbing in your home to renovating an old building for a new use, there are delays and setbacks, hurdles and impediments and ultimately, Miss Miller was not able to open the operation of the Miller House until March of 2019. Therefore, September of 2019 is within that confine of six months. In preparation for tonight's presentation, the Department of Planning contacted two key participants in the protection of the public safety and the enforcement of codes. Those are the St. Louis County Police Department Wildwood Precinct and the Metro West Fire Protection District. As part of the attachment and other additional information, you will see that the department received two emails in response to its inquiries, and both the police department and the fire district noted that they had not received any calls for service in that area. 
the only call for service was the annual inspection that was undertaken by the fire district at the start of 2019, which is standard practice for any public facility that offers services to the, to the general public. The Department of Planning also has a code enforcement role in regards to any residential, commercial, or institutional property located within the city. A check of the Department of Planning's records indicate that other than some miscommunication on the placement of an emblem for signage purposes on the existing freestanding monument sign, there have been no issuances of warning notices or summonses for the same. All in all, between the St. Louis County Police Department, the Metro West Fire Protection District, and the City of Wildwood itself, there are no records of any problematic issues that have arisen over the first six months of operation. In the report, the department does note that it would be short-sighted on the part of the city to say that there probably hasn't been a car or two parked somewhere where it shouldn't be on a public street, whether it be Rockwood Point Court or East Avenue. But all in all, for us to know of those things, a complaint needs to be lodged so it can be logged and addressed at that time if needed, or at least become part of the reporting process that's required of this particular biz business. The reporting process is not intended to be punitive. Again, it is a second tier site off Manchester Road, and it is in close proximity to residential properties. Both the Planning and Zoning Commission and City Council, along with Ms. Miller, thought that to ensure that people would know that it is a good use, an appropriate use, agreed to this condition and have moved forward with it as such. So tonight the department is presenting what it believes is a clean report relative to the operation of this facility at this town center location. I would note that under the current ordinance, each year an annual report will be required. So sometime in September 2020, the department will return with an updated version of what you have tonight. If there are any questions of the Department of Planning, the City Attorney, or Ms. Miller, we'd be glad to address them at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boonich. I have a motion to accept the department. Uh, Mr. B. Second by um, Councilman Werther. Any discussion? No discussion. Um, roll call vote. Commissioner Levitt? Yes. Commissioner Gragnani? Yes. Commissioner Beatty? Yes. Commissioner Deppler? Yes. Commissioner Helfrey? Yes. Chair Lee? Yes. Councilmember Werther? Aye. Mayor Bolin? Yes. And Thank Mr. You. Chairman, I have a question for Joe. Mayor Bolin. Joe, relative to the requirement that year after year this come back comes back to the commission, do you think it would be worthwhile for you to provide the commission with a review given the history that we now have as to whether that requirement is, um, I guess, remains warranted? That's a very good question, Mr. Mayor. As you know, we had a very similar requirement for the Big Chief Roadhouse after they had been authorized for limited live music on their patio area. We went through several years of annual reviews. Um, for the most part, the neighborhood had accommodated it. Ms. Um, Mulholland had adhered to the requirements, and it moved to a three-year cycle. So certainly what I would suggest is if we go another year from now to September 2020, at the time of the annual report, the department will bring forward a request maybe to extend that period to a three- to five-year period. Okay, thank you. Mr. Newberry, are you reading the site development plan? A recommendation report for a new monument type sign for New Community Church, St. Louis County's PC 
26-891 New Community Church, which is required given its current representation, will be removed from its existing location by the City of Wildwood as part of its Phase 3 Manchester Road Streetscape Project, amended C8 Planned Commercial District, north side of Manchester Road, west of Taylor Road, roundabout. Street address 16801 Manchester Road, St. Louis County, locator number 24V630297, thereby supporting the proposed siting of it at the selected location along the property's primary frontage, Ward 8. Thank you, Mr. Newberry. Mr. Vunich. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair and members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, the Department of Planning has prepared for your consideration tonight a recommendation regard, report regarding a amended site development plan for New Community Church. New Community Church is located on the north side of Manchester Road, a short distance west of the Taylor Road roundabout. The property has a long history, and that history is developed briefly in the report that's been provided for the Commission's consideration tonight. It was originally a dinner theater location called The Barn. It became Bubba Coy's Fish uh, Restaurant, and then ultimately now New Community Church. If you see the exterior of the building or go inside the facility itself, you would be hard pressed to realize it was anything but a church for many, many years. As noted in the advertisement, the city of Wildwood has been proceeding forward with the Manchester Road streetscape in phases. The first phase was from Snooks Wildwood Crossing on the east to the Taylor Road roundabout. The second phase was from State Route 109 on the west end to Etherton Road by the porch um, on the east end. The final segment is the segment that is underway now, and that is for primarily from the Taylor Road roundabout to Etherton Road or the porch. The third phase is the most difficult phase in that it is the most developed in terms of commercial businesses and has taken the greatest amount of time to coordinate access, utility relocation, etc. Ultimately, the new right-of-way will be different than the first two phases in that the lessons we've learned relative to street trees and great stormwater management are being applied here in phase three. Ultimately, what that meant is additional right-of-way or easements were needed. Those additional right-of-way or easements ultimately meant, in the case of New Community Church, its sign had to be relocated. The City of Wildwood is working closely with New Community Church on this sign relocation. The sign itself has been authorized by the Board of Adjustment relative to a setback variance. And now tonight, per the site-specific ordinance that dates back to 1991, the Planning and Zoning Commission must approve the location of the sign. There's a little quirk to all of this. The existing sign is located in Manchester Road right-of-way, always has been given the slope of the site, would make it difficult to see it if pushed further to the north into the parking area. Obviously, placing it in the parking area, it becomes an obstruction relative to either a parking space or two, or the drive aisle itself. The new sign location is also in the public right-of-way. The Director of Public Works has the authority to authorize that, but the governing ordinance gives final approval to the Planning and Zoning Commission. So tonight, that is why the sign via an amended site development plan is before the Commission for consideration. Regardless of the authority of the Director of Public Works, the site-specific ordinance gives that final authority to the Commission. This has been worked through with the city's engineer that's engaged for Manchester Road Phase 3 streetscape. This has been worked through between the Department of Public Works and New Community Church. The Board of Adjustment of the City of Wildwood has authorized a zero-foot setback, which is the most it can grant relative to the placement. And tonight, the department is recommending approval of the signed location. 
It is important to note it will be behind the sidewalk or to the north of the sidewalk and will be verified for any site distance considerations. A key element of the Board of Adjustments action was that it could be up to 50 square feet, which is the standard or maximum size for a freestanding sign for an institutional use. But based upon the final design and construction of the streetscape, the Department of Planning can make it smaller in size if it believes it achieves the goal at a lesser square footage. That was the Board of Adjustments action. So assume the sign would be no greater than 50 square feet, but in the opinion of the department, may likely be less than 50 square feet based upon its proximity to the roadway. And with that, Mr. Chair, the department is recommending approval of the amended site development plan for the new monument sign for new community church. And after discussion or a motion, the department will be available to respond to any comments or answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boonich. I'll entertain a motion, but I have a question when we get to the Motion point. to approve. Um, Councilman Werther, second. Commissioner Levitt. Um, I'll go with my question. So the sign is off-site of the property. So the city will have to create an easement and also um, easement language for maintenance because the city does not want to take over the maintenance of this since it's not on site. So I guess this is a question for Mr. Young. You'll have to check and make sure they have um, documentations on maintenance and uh, anything else that they would need out there, access, um, because it's off the property. And it's this is a challenge because it goes against our sign code. You have to be on site to have a sign. Are you asking me that we've confirmed that they've got the proper easements to locate the sign on the property and access it for maintenance purposes? Um, yes. Okay. I have not personally done that, but I believe that that was part of the submission requirements. That's correct. And so the process, at least from the department's perspective, has been to first take it to the Board of Adjustment because of the necessity of the setback requirement relative to the underlying regulations, then to the Planning and Zoning Commission for final location, and then if granted by the Planning and Zoning Commission, complete the task that you just described to create the necessary easement area both for the placement and then access to maintain and then the provisions to protect the city from any liability or any maintenance requirements over the course of time. So will Planning Commission review that document or does that go on to Council? I'd be more than happy to provide it to the Planning and Zoning Commission to guarantee that your action relative to the placement of the sign addressed your concerns. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mayor Boland. If I could just follow up to that. I was going to ask something similar, which was uh, you mentioned, Joe, the uh, proviso that the department would ultimately assess in its discretion, you know, the size of the sign and potentially location. Uh, when, well, will and if so, when and how will the commission have that final report from the department that shows after it's all said and done, this is where it's located, and this is what it looks like, and this is the size, and so forth. The department had promised the Board of Adjustment, as it will now with the Planning and Zoning Commission, the sign's actual fabrication and installation will not occur until much of the road improvements are complete. The concern of New Community Church has been relative to the on-street parking that's being added in front of the facility. And their concern is parked cars will block the view of the sign, and they believe the sign needed to be actually 55 square feet in size, not 50 or less. The department's contention is the only way to know that for sure is to have the improvements constructed and then park some cars there. And if it is what you think it is, then you get 50 square feet. If it's not, you'll receive less. So once, it, once we get to that point, 
the department has no problem bringing that information back to the Planning and Zoning Commission for its input and action. There's no objection from the department from the commissioners. I would ask that you you do that. And then just um, one other question: um, the vote on the board of adjustment was was it unanimous or? Yes, sir. Okay. And this is just a suggestion, not a criticism. Uh, going forward, when we have a board that rep, you know that has voted, if we could get that statement, or if it is a, a divided vote, who they were and what wards they represent, so we have that. So no, no biggie, just would be a little helpful sometimes. So it's an excellent suggestion. I wish I had thought of it. Uh, no worries. All right, thank you, we Mr. Will Chairman. We will do that for now on. And what I'll do is I'll send the minutes of the meeting and the application that was signed by the chair of the board via email once I get out of jury duty. Thank you so much. Seeing no objections, we'll add Mayor Boland's comments. Uh, Commissioner Greg Nani. Mr. Vunich, I had a quick question. I had the same concern that Chair Lee had about the maintenance of the sign in light of under your summary of design and engineering plans under number one you say that the sign will be purchased by the city so i just wanted to make sure that we were not liable for maintenance and and all that goes along with with a sign it is my understanding through negotiations with new community church they did not request any reimbursement for the additional area that was necessary of their property to do the design streetscape but in lieu of a payment for easement or dedication the sign was a negotiated item okay. relative to that uh, that that effort uh, it is not the intent of the city to maintain a sign um, we'd be terrible at it and if the department had its choice it would not have a sign there but um, that's not what the code allows and that's not what's been negotiated in good faith between the city and new community church thank you councilman Worthy. thank you mr finich um notice that we've got two types of lighting associated with this sign basically the cross itself is backlit the letters are internally lit what type of lighting are we using for or is proposed for being internally lit here in this particular instance they have the option of internal or backlit as well as for matter of fact external the governing ordinance which is still applicable despite the fact that it was done in 1991 does not specify the type of lighting and so if you defer to the underlying zoning requirements the sign regulations it accommodates a full range for these types of signs. Okay, then let me just ask a question then. Given that we typically see all the necessary details for site plans, is, can we also have the, the question of the lighting brought back so we understand exactly what type of lighting ends up being employed on the final Certainly. Side of the sign? Yeah, as was requested by the mayor and a uh, supported by the department once we get to that stage and the lighting selection is complete that'll be part of the packet that you receive one of the items that changed through the department's review process is that we required the dark background with the light lettering which is consistent with our outdoor lighting requirements so even with the internal illumination it's improved now the question will become if internal illumination is selected ensuring that the wattage or the brightness of the sign isn't too much to create that nuisance glare that trespass etc exactly thank you commissioner Beatty. Um, just out of curiosity how big is it? it's 30 square feet it's consistent with the current code Yes. Well, actually, I have received it from the Board of Adjustment at this stage. But I will note that part of the rationale for the support, I believe, by the Board of Adjustment is that previously there used to be wall signage in conjunction with the other uses. That was removed. There's no wall signage now. So 
they felt that um, that this was an appropriate approach. I can guarantee you that we'll look long and hard at the final size. Obviously, there's a difference between 30 square feet and 50 square feet, as you have mentioned, Mr. Beattie. Yeah, uh, I've got the side up on the Google Street View. It's under the required 10 feet. It's 9 feet, 1 inch. So um, their point being, again, is that with the parked car, a certain portion of the sign, if the spaces are utilized on the on-street component, that the sign will be less visible than the one that's there now. I don't know if that's the case. Again, Part of the discussion at Board of Adjustment, and we've had this discussion here at the Commission, is churches usually aren't impulse um, kind of um, uh, trips in that you know, you, you're a member, even if you're a visitor, you generally, nowadays you can you plug it into your phone before you leave and it'll walk you, basically describe the directions to get there. So. Like I say, we're, we've got a lot, there's a bit of a process still here, but to meet the requirements of the process that's been established by the Department of Public Works, we wanted to bring this to you sooner than later. Commissioner Levin. I, have a, I think it's a procedural question. Um, I was the one who seconded this. Given that we're asking for some more information from the department, um, as far as final size, uh, type of lighting, etc., would it be appropriate to postpone this vote um, until we get that information and then review it? And so I'd like to make a motion that we postpone that, this vote, until we have that information. Seconds. Mayor Bowen, you want to? I think we can add the comments to the recommendations and it's coming back anyway well i might be willing to second that I'd, uh to through the chair to the to commissioner levitt uh your reasoning for the postponement is because we don't have the final information on size um or type of lighting i'll second Just as a point of information, the size has been granted per se by the Board of Adjustment. That's an independent board. It's not beholden to the Commission or City Council, just the Circuit Court of St. Louis County. Um, but there is going to be a variation potentially in the size. Secondly, the outdoor lighting requirements are completely within your purview. And so from that perspective, Certainly, if you feel that you want to know the lighting down to the exact details, a postponement would be justified. Let's vote on the postponement. Um, voice vote works. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. We'll postpone. Motion to adjourn. Yeah. Okay. Uh, second. Need a second. Commissioner Levitt, seconds. All those in favor of adjournment say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you all very much. We appreciate it. Hey, when it comes down to adjournment, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm there with the best of them at that point. Rest of the night, maybe not so much, but for that, yeah.